Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to the table. I'm so glad that you are with us. And it's going to be a special time together. Uh, we've got a lot in store. And just want to let you know wherever you are and wherever you come from that all of you is welcome in this space. And we so anticipate the very real presence of Jesus that brings us together and this mysterious way that those of us who previously have not been a people become a people, even through the mystery of the internet. So before we go any further, I'm going to ask our prayer pastor, Mackenzie, to come and to lead us in a reading from the psalm. It's a beautiful psalm coming from the message, and I think the psalms are especially powerful in terms of just clearing up our heads and clearing up the heart space, really, to enter into a place of worship, uh, sometimes for lament, sometimes for rejoicing, but especially in terms of this whole idea of bringing our whole selves into the presence of God and into the company of each other. That's exactly what the Psalms are written to do. So Mackenzie, if you would lead us. Yes. Yes. Welcome everybody. Um, beautiful table family this morning. Um, so yes, this is a Psalm of Thanksgiving or uh, yes, a Psalm of Thanksgiving and uh, Psalm 100. So um, just may the spirit fill, fill these beautiful poetic words and just the language of them hit our hearts. Um, so here we go. On your feet now, applaud God, bring a gift of laughter, sing yourselves into his presence. Know this, God is God and God, God. He made us, we didn't make him. We're his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter, the pass enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home, talking praise, thank him, worship him, for God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal, always and forever. Mm, pretty powerful. So now I'm gonna pass it on to Julie, who's gonna give the pastoral prayer. Be blessed. There we go. Hi everyone, it's so good to see you guys this morning, but those of you that I can't see, I miss you um, this morning. Just come with us today, and we're just going to pray over you this morning. Creator God, precious spirit, Jesus, our friend, we just pray this morning for all of those who question, all of those who are unsettled, all of those that are not sure which way to go. We just pray that you would be there with us in that moment that you would be guiding our steps that you would be with us in spirit that you would just help us to know that we are not alone and that we have grace to make um, the next steps in our journey I just pray that over all of us that question I pray for those who suffer whether it be in body or mind or spirit we pray for those we pray for Malika this morning who is not feeling well we just pray for healing for those that suffer we pray that we would be comforted we pray that those that suffer would feel your grace on them in those moments and although we don't always have the answers. We pray that you would be there to bring peace, the peace that doesn't really have an explanation, but a, a peace that brings true and deep fulfillment. And we just pray for those who, um, who need a touch, that need to feel um, connected this morning. We pray for those who um, need to feel your presence. We pray for those who might feel an emptiness within them. We just pray that you would be there, that you would connect with us, that we would feel your presence in that moment, and we would know that we are not alone. I pray that you would connect us with the beloved community, that even though we are in this time of unprecedented isolation, that we would be connected, however that may be, whether that may be through online spaces or in other ways. We just pray that you would bring a connection, that we would know that we are together and that we would see the Imago Day, the image of you in everyone that we connect with. We just pray that over this community today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Awesome. Well, awesome. This morning, I'm going to be passing this off to Lauren, who's going to be reading our scripture today. 
Good morning, guys. I am happy to be back with you. And I just want to give a big thanks for all of the prayers and the love that I've felt um, the last few weeks. So I'm grateful for all of you. Um, it's really meant a lot to me. So I'm going to jump right into our text, um, which is the gospel text, Matthew 25. Um, we're going to start at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will repri reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And now I'm going to send it over to Jonathan um, to do our homily. Thank you, Lauren. The word of God for the people of God. And I tell you, we, we really have been praying for you, Lauren. As she lost her grandmother in the last few weeks, uh, the person in the world really that she's been closest to. And uh, I always tell Lauren it's true. She's one of the people who makes me happiest. And I think seeing her here as part of this call that we have together, I don't know. It just, there's a lot, it just puts me in mind again, because I think even about so many of the conversations that I've had this week. And I feel like, we, I mean, when was the last time we haven't said something like this? But it's just the heaviness of the time, the heaviness of the moment. And here we have a very heavy text. And in some ways, maybe the tendency would be to try to escape the heavy text, to escape the weighty text, to go into something simpler or easier. And maybe especially, uh, some of you might think, for a community like the table, that's very unashamed and unapologetic to use words like love and to use words like inclusion and to use them loudly, to use them boldly, to use them with a sense of spirit, to use them with a sense of power, I think. But we're not, in fact, afraid to talk about judgment. In fact, I think we must talk about judgment, that maybe, in fact, there's never been a better time to talk about judgment. Because I think this is a time in which, whether we like it or not, whether whatever end we kind of fall on it, judgment is happening. Judgment is real. Judgment is always happening. Discernment is always happening. Judgment, separation, separation from light and dark. Separa There's always a kind of separation that's happening. And in this season, which I've been saying for a number of years, some of you know, uh, that has been an especially apocalyptic time, a revealing time, when so much that's been hidden has been coming to the surface, there's no getting around that this is a time of judgment. So I think it's nearly impossible to not speak about judgment. In fact, interestingly enough, I feel like right now almost everybody is talking about judgment in some form or another. 
and I hear certain kinds of people talking about judgment in one way. In fact, I feel like uh, one side of my social media feed is blowing up with it. They use a certain kind of judgment talk towards a certain group of people and are very convinced about what scripture says about judgment. And they capitalize on certain kinds of images, some of which comes from texts like this one, which I find to be especially interesting. Because we really only have a handful of texts that use the kind of imagery that we get in a place like Matthew 25 that's quite this stark. This language of eternal fire, and some of you heard me talk about hell and that kind of thing before. I don't have time to go into like a full exposition that tonight, but this is what I find really, really interesting, is that some of the folks who will talk the most rapidly, the most fiercely, the most convinced about the language and imagery of hell, drawing on the kind of imagery that we get in a text like Matthew 25, yet are completely uncomfortable to talk about the context of this language of judgment as we get it in Matthew 25. But I don't want to skip too far ahead into that just yet. Because I note even people that don't necessarily believe in that kind of judgment, who aren't thinking about that kind of judgment, or aren't um, judging the kinds of people that fundamentalist Christians would typically judge, they're, they're using judgment kind of language too. Because I think right now, this is just a, a time in which we're wrestling with the whole idea of consequence and in the COVID age. And we're thinking a lot about human responsibility and what do we do with the moment we've been given and what does it mean to be responsible to our neighbors and to our friends and all of that. So all kinds of questions of judgment that are being stirred up and there is no getting around it. Jesus here in this, our gospel text speaks very starkly about judgment. But I want us to slowly and prayerfully enter into this text. And in just a few moments, actually, I want to take you also into our Old Testament reading, which we haven't gone to yet from Ezekiel, because I think it's a crucial one. And I just, I, I want to almost be pleading here that you could hear some of this kind of like you're hearing it for the first time, because I think it's so important. But I also think so much of this is so misunderstood. Jesus gives us an image of nations gathered before him. So it's not even a scene of individual judgment, but it's a judgment of the nations first, but then where peoples are separated and they're separated between sheep and goats. Now for most of my life, and I'm not even being condescending about this, okay? So don't, don't hear that, but this is just how I would have understood it. I, I would have thought, I remember it, it was so, I was probably well into my twenties before I read a text like Matthew 25, and first really experienced the jolt of it because I could read any text about judgment and make it fit what I already believed. And what I already believed was that Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of the Lords, at the end of time was going to gather all the peoples around the throne and he was going to separate them into two categories. Those who prayed the sinner's prayer and those who have not. Those who answered the altar call at youth camp and those who had not. Those who had shouted and spoken tongues, those who had not. Those who had unashamedly bought, brought their Bible to school and witnessed to their friends, and those who had not. That was my idea of judgment. That was my idea of like what Jesus was going to be doing at the end of days. So it was quite surprising to me and quite troubling to me when for the first time I came upon this text and read it honestly for the first time and had to grapple with this that Jesus does talk about this kind of separation between sheep and goats, and he doesn't talk at all about beliefs. He doesn't talk about doctrine. He doesn't talk about dogma. And I'm saying this is somebody who fully believes in the Apostles' Creed, who fully believes in the resurrection of Jesus. But frankly, friends, there's simply not a pop quiz here on what you believe about anything, about who's going up or who's going down, or whether or not you're orthodox on this point or of that but rather this separation between sheep and goats comes down not so much to belief, not so much to doctrine, not so much to idea, but all about action. Just to revisit the text here for just a moment there, and then, then we'll, we'll really dive into some things. But it is the king who says to them in verse 34, or verse 35 rather, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And it's the righteous who answers, 
Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? See, questions of judgment are always questions of discernment. They're always questions about how we see, what we see. They're questions about how we see each other. Hear that. They're not just, these aren't just questions about how we see God. These aren't just questions about how we see the divine. These are questions about how we see each other. Are we able to see the image of God in one another? That's what Jesus is really driving at here. I, the righteous are saying, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and we gave you food? Because we did not see Scandinavian, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, Venice Beach Jesus sitting around in the prison and give them anything. We, we, we didn't see that. We didn't see Jesus come to life out of a 1950s white people movie. We didn't see any. We didn't see that Jesus. So, what, so we, we don't know what you mean. But then it's that that's when Jesus, that's the conceit. That's where he turns this around. That's, that's when Jesus says to them, the king answers them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are member, members of my family, you did it to me. And so as Jesus does over and over again throughout his ministry, always love for God and love for neighbor are so intricately connected. Isn't it wild? especially considering the way that we talk about judgment, the way I still hear it even now, that we always think that judgment is ultimately going to be between the moral and the immoral. You know what I'm talking about, right? Moral and the immoral. Who has kept the rules versus who has broken the rules? Who has really abided by the law versus who has broken by the law? But that's not what we get. And in fact, Jesus gives us the converse of that and even turns it around. Then, verse 41, he says to those on his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And I'll have to save my thoughts on, on the fire for another time, though I have many. But I, but I want you to hear this because I think it's so important in a time in which so many people will tell us that the difference, that what judgment is really about is about belief, is about ideology. That Jesus isn't talking about belief. He's not talking about ideology. He's talking about action. And he's also talking about how we see one another and whether or not we see the image of God in one another. I was talking to my dear friend, Dr. Chris Green about some of this just today. And Chris, because Chris has such brilliant thoughts on this particular text that I was thinking of, and I thought about this quote of Chris's in particular, that the difference between the sheep and the goats is how the sheep feel about the goats and what they're willing to do for them, knowing full well that they cannot and do not need to make them sheep. <laughs> the difference between the sheep and the goats is how the sheep see the goats, how the sheep feel about the goats, how the sheep relate to the goats. Isn't that interesting? We get so preoccupied with, am I a sheep or am I a goat? Am I going up or am I going down? When ultimately, what has all of this ever really been about, but about how we see each other, how we see, how sheep see those who are designated as goats, how they, we see those who are designated as somehow being outside of the fold in some way. And to be clear, scripture does make a distinction because I'm not trying to take away, you know, this is just not what I do. I just don't go around putting a positive spin on things. That, uh, I'm certainly not interested in that in a moment like this one. I feel disingenuous. It's not that scripture doesn't make a, it doesn't distinguish somehow between those who are faithful and those who are not. Scripture absolutely makes a distinction between faithfulness and faithlessness, but it's how that distinction is made. Yes, there's, there seems to be some kind of a difference between the saints and the rest of us. It's just that difference is not a moral difference. It's not between being moral and immoral. It's another, uh, and as Chris puts it here, Jesus reveals that holiness is no more like morality than it is like immorality. What makes the saints saints is that they embody the holiness of God which is his generosity and hospitality towards his enemies. That's always been what it's about. The Jesus who says on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. We have seen over and over again how God treats God's enemies. 
the one who told us to bless our enemies. We've seen how he was treated in the person of Christ when people used him, when people abused him, when people came after him, when people tormented him, when people spoke ill of him. We've seen what that kind of radical forgiveness looks like through the person of Jesus. And now that Jesus is calling us to that very kind of life. This ultimately is the distinction between the sheep and the goats. It's not about who has or has not kept the rules, but who's walking in this kind of radical forgiveness? Who's walking in this kind of love? Who's, 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 who's working for this kind of justice? Who's willing to turn the tables in this way? This is really what this text is about. It is not a moralistic text, but it is a text that has a lot to say about generosity. And it is a text that has a lot to say about hospitality and making space for people who've been designated as an other in some way. That's all of this is about. And I'm just, I'm feeling the weight of it even in this moment that somehow Jesus brings it all down to this, that this is like what ul the ultimate judgment is for Jesus. And yet I, I wanna be careful about this because <laughs> now I feel like we're about to really turn something on its head here. I think even in that, it's still a sick use of a text like this one because I think sometimes some of us are just religious enough. We have just enough wiring to where it's still like, okay, so how do I make sure though that I'm a sheep and I'm not one of them goats? I want to make sure I'm not one of them goats. How to make sure I'm not one of the bad people. As if somehow that's the point of it, is that there's an us and a them, and that we get to be higher and someone else is lower. And how do we know that we're an us unless we have a them, et cetera, et cetera. That's where I want to incorporate our uh, First Testament reading, if you'll give me just a couple minutes more here. Because as we put these texts together, like, that in the wisdom of the church calendar, are so, so beautifully mesh, both from the, uh, the, the prophet Ezekiel, and then from the gospel of Matthew, what we see is that God is the one that not only judges between sheep and goats. But let me try this one out on you. God is the one who also judges between sheep and sheep, which is the image that we get in Ezekiel 11. If you have your Bibles and or electronic devices and or whatever, Ezekiel 11 verses 11 through 16, and then verses 20 through 24. That's our older First Testament reading. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. Before I read any further, I'm gonna take just a second and I'm gonna stop and meddle and sometimes when I say things like this, I don't know if it's necessary for some of you or, or depending on where you come from, if it's helpful or clarifying or not. So maybe I'm doing this for my benefit, I'm not sure, but I feel like it's important maybe to say this because I've been reminded of this even again in more recent weeks, that as some people of faith, particular people of faith in America, kind of have this view of the world where their anticipation of what's to come is some vision of God is going to regather Israel as a modern nation state somehow over against everybody else. And there's going to be some kind of cataclysmic war that's going to usher in the second coming of Jesus or, some, or something like that. All of that breaks my heart for a couple of different reasons. Not because I don't believe that God is faithful to that covenant that he made to Abraham and to the people and peoples of Abraham. I absolutely do. And this is said as a bit of a slur. It's not even believed that like, that like God has somehow replaced that covenant. That covenant has not been replaced, but that covenant has decisively been expanded. That covenant that God made to Abraham has now been opened up to where the true people of Abraham are comprised both of those that come through the, line the lineage of the, the law, the lineage of the Jewish people of God, and also all of those who believe, all of those who worship that God, wherever they come from. 
And so I think this gathering that happens in the end that Ezekiel prophesies is not about a, a handful of people somehow being selectively gathered into a nation state. It's much more beautiful than that. It, there are so many sheep that feel scattered. There are so many sheep that feel lost. There are so many people that for so many reasons feel displaced and disoriented and don't have a home. And the vision that Ezekiel gives us is that the time comes when God will gather all of God's sheep. And God's sheep come from all kinds of places and from all walks of life. How can Matthew 25 not break our imagination open to that? And, and Jesus rendering of the sheep and the goats. This is not Israelites and non-Israelites. This is not Jews and Gentiles, Christians and Muslims. This is something much bigger than that. Here are, here's an image of the God who comes to bring all of those who have not yet been a people, to make them into a people. I'm partly sensitive to this because I, as a person who uh, loves and has known a lot of Palestinian Christians who have been on the wrong side of how a lot of these texts have been used, I'm especially sensitive to this. But really, again, this is, a, this is good news for all of the lost and scattered sheep. Uh, I don't know if that aside was necessarily helpful, but I'm, I'm, I'm preachy on the Zoom. Verse 14, though, Ezekiel 11, for, for, verse 14. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture and shall lie down in good grazing land and shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. Isn't that beautiful? So many people that try to take authority, so many people that try to assert their will and their way, but here's this vision of the God who has always been the one and only true shepherd who now brings everyone back together. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong, I will destroy. Now, since we went in reverse order and we started with the gospel text, we already have a sense, right, of, of something of where this story has always been going, is that God takes very seriously those who are lean, those who hunger, those who are uh, oppressed, those who are marginalized, those who are starving. That's uh, Yes, for, for those who, who have been well-fed and overstuffed, and don't care about the plight of anybody else. God's always felt really strongly about this. But listen to what the definition of God's judgment sounds like even there. I, I want to make sure you see this in the text. Verse 16. I will, one more time. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. And what does that judgment look like? I will feed them with justice. That's the judgment that's coming, is that God will feed with justice. And we have an awful lot of people who've been well-fed in other ways and who have been satiated in other ways. A lot of us, people like me, we have plenty, don't we? But we're, in fact, starving for justice, and we don't know that. We think we've got enough, but what we don't have is justice. And the way that God is going to make things right ultimately will not be through uh, th what the, the punishment is, is that we're going to be fed with justice. We're going to be fed with the reality of mountains brought low and valleys exhausted. We need a good dose and uh, of, of justice and a second helping of justice. That's the kind of judgment that's coming. Verse 20, therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. So apparently God not only judges between the sheep and the goats, but between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. Verse 22, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. 
I, the Lord, have spoken. I really am going to wind this thing down, but I just think it's such a provocative image because even in the moment that we might even get a little cozy in the idea, well, sheep and goats, I've done some charitable giving. I visited a soup kitchen once. Obviously, I'm a sheep. <laughs> Let's keep in mind that this is a God that not only judges between sheep and goats, but this is the God who says, I will judge between sheep and sheep. This God is the great equalizer. There's no room for anybody to be anything less than humble. And I think part of what this text says to us, and I think this is part of what we uh, really what we need to hear, is that you know, God's, God's judgment here turns out not just between, not just to be between sheep and goats, but also it's between sheep and sheep. It's between sheep and shepherds. And part of what reveals, this is part of what Chris and I were talking about today, and he's, he, he speaks about so beautifully. Part of what reveals the heart of the true shepherd is this recognition that goats are only lean sheep. What we have really are that, that often pass as goats are really sheep without a shepherd. That's what you really have. And that's where as much as sometimes I can kind of be a bit of a crusader the other direction when I feel some kind of injustice or whatever, that's really what I see a lot of is I see a lot of sheep without a shepherd. I see a lot of sheep that act like goats. I see a lot of sheep that act like bullies to other sheep. And the fact is they're sheep without a shepherd. They don't they, they haven't been lying down in green pastures. They haven't experienced the tenderness of the good shepherd. They haven't been led in the ways of Jesus. They have wounds of their own that have not been bound up. That's ultimately what it's about. And so our goal as the church and um, our goal, my, I say a goal, what my hope, even with a talk like this one, is not to give it to the goats but to say to those who feel like goats that you don't have to be a goat, that in the way there are no goats, only lean sheep. Come be fed by the good shepherd. Come experience the tenderness of Jesus. Come and allow those wounds to be tended to. What I see with people who speak out of judgment and anger and wrath is people who are in a great deal of pain, who are unable to forgive themselves and unable to experience God's shalom, God's goodness, God's beauty in their own lives. So they take it out on everybody else. And it's not God's will. It's not God's desire that you live in that place. It's precisely because people have not experienced and not been able to internalize the mercy of God for themselves that they turn all of these things outward. And so what do they do? They end up devouring other sheep. They end up devouring other sheep because they themselves have not been fed. But then comes the good shepherd who wants to feed us with justice and wants to feed us with good things, who wants to satisfy us. Taste and see, the psalmist said, that the Lord is good so that we don't have to devour each other, so that we don't have to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so that we don't have to get fat off our own judgments. We don't have to satiate ourselves with our own common sense about who's up and down or, who, or who's in and out because the good shepherd tends to us. And so what's in this really ultimately, even for those who might feel themselves to be on the wrong side of this, is an invitation, is an invitation to come and be tended to by the shepherd. Because ultimately in the grand scheme of things, the, the God is all of our shepherd. And there's a very, very real way in which all of us are sheep. And for those of us who uh, are, you know, if, if it's true that God will judge the sheep based on how they treat the goats, how they look at the goats, here's an invitation for even those for whom that cuts against us to make that right, to see the image of God in one another and to get out of, to repent, to turn around, to turn away from those ways that, um, that devour and those ways that consume and instead to be fed and to come out of that system of scarcity and to come into a place where there is abundance, to come into a place where there is always enough because God is the one who gives us our daily bread because God is the one who provides and in God there is enough. So 
That's the invitation is not only a word of judgment, but what is judgment ever, but a, a revealing of our true selves, a revealing of the world as it is, so that we might have the opportunity to repent and come to see the world as God does, to come to see the way that God is calling us to see. So with that in view, let's pray. God, we thank you that you are the good shepherd. And we ask you that even in this moment, <laughs> sorry about my dog, y'all. We ask you, Jesus, that you would come and visit each of us because we're so aware that all of us, uh, there's not a single one of us from this text does not cut against us. And we know that this is the word of the Lord precisely because it does break our hearts precisely because it goes crossways against our hearts. So deliver us from the smug assumption, uh, assumption that we are somehow sheep and that others are somehow goats. Deliver us from thinking that somehow that how we are seen by you and how we fit into any of this is somehow not contingent on how we love others and how we see others. And we pray that you would just instead of coming out of a place of poverty and scarcity where we devour and where we consume, could you bring us once again into your green pastures where we are fed, where we have enough, where you are enough for us and where all of us are your sheep and you are our true shepherd. I pray specifically for those who feel scattered. I pray for specifically for those who feel lost, for those who um, feel like they can't quite find their place. Thank you that this time of judgment is also a time when you are gathering those who have been displaced and you are gathering those who have not felt themselves as a people. And truly you are making us a people as happens once again all over this morning when we come to your table, that we experience that miracle. So we thank you for the gift of your words. We thank you for the gift of your spirit that brings us together and makes us one. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys. Uh, just before, and, and I want to go ahead and prepare you for that. If you need to make preparations, Lance is going to come in just a moment and is going to lead us to the table of Christ where each of you are welcome, where all of you are welcome. And I'm telling you, it makes all the difference in the world. If, you know, part of, uh, I don't even know if I've got language for this right now, but I can see it so clearly in my mind. If part of the difference between the sheep and the goats is whether or not we're going to approach our neighbors from a posture, are we, are we consuming? Are we grabbing? Are we devouring? Are we looking to get our own? Or are we coming open-handed? Are we coming from a posture of dependence? It's all bound up in this table. That's why we believe, and I do believe this, that every time we offer this extension, even uh, this invitation, even in this weird way that we do it on the internet, that is an invitation to salvation, that it's an invitation to know the good shepherd, that it's an invitation to life and life more abundantly. So know that you're invited. I do just want to mention that if anybody would like to join us, uh, that uh, and we'll, we've got this up on all of our uh, t uh, socials at the table. Some of you know that really throughout this year, I've been uh, tag teaming with my friends, Dr. Drew Hart and Jared McKenna, do a couple of wonderful book studies on Drew's two great books. Now we're about to do yet another book study on Howard Thurman's classic book uh, that uh, Jesus and the Disinherited. It's just such an important book. And I would love for you to join us. That's going to be kicking, I think, on December 2nd. We've got all the details there, but we would just love for you to join us. So if you need uh, some kind of community right now and you're interested in this whole conversation around justice, it's a great book. These are great people and a very international, very diverse community um, where I promise you, you will learn and grow as I have learned and grown so much from kind of being in this company. So know that you're invited to do that and make sure to check out uh, just again, table, socials, anywhere, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you are, has all the information where you can sign up for us there. But I don't want to take away from the main event because why do we do this? Why are we called the table? Except because this is what it's about, is that now we get to actually come to this table where we're able to taste and see and participate. So let's make ourselves ready as Dr. Lance leads us. Lance.
Hello, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Oh, I don't think you can see me. Oh, there you go. So thank you all for being here this morning. I'm so excited um, that you've joined us. There's a lot of places you could be online right now for, for church, and we're so glad that you decided to join us. And Jonathan, that was a fantastic message. Thank you to Julie and Mackenzie for leading us this morning and for Lauren to um, be on here and to read our scriptures. As Jonathan said, I think that this is um, the perfect thing to do every single week to come back week after week and to dine with Jesus together. I think that is the image of each and every text that um, we read this morning. You know, we come in and we, we are in God's presence in thankfulness and in gratitude. That's why it's called the Eucharist. That means Thanksgiving. It, it, it tells us that um, this is the meal that God gives us to feed us with justice, right? This is the meal that we come to because I don't remember who said it. It's some famous saint. He said, if you don't see Christ in the homeless man, you don't see Christ in the Eucharist. So it's just a, it's just a thing that we do every single week that's just perfect to bring us back to the center of the kingdom and what that means um, just to do life together. So as we do each and every single week, we are going to confess our sins against God and our neighbor because we've all done and said things this week that haven't been in alignment with love. And God invites us to acknowledge those things and to remember his forgiveness. So uh, if you don't have this memorized, that's okay. It should be at the bottom of the screen in the comments. And I invite you to do this from a, a, a position of humility and not like you're twisting God's arm to give you something that he hasn't already given you. We confess because we're forgiven um, and we don't do it out of fear. We do it out of faith. So most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our, our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And friends, as we say each and every week, hear these not as my words, but as the words of the risen and reigning Jesus, the Messiah, that you are known, that you are loved, that you are forgiven, that you are cleansed, that you are whole, and that you're beloved. So receive that and believe that. And now as people who are forgiven and part of the beloved community, let us confess what we hold dear in our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, let us pray the prayer of the kingdom that Jesus taught us all to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now before we come to the table, I just want to give you guys an opportunity, if you haven't already, to get your elements ready, whether that be bread and wine or whatever you have on hand. We, we believe that Jesus is in and with and under those elements that you offer up to him in thanksgiving and faith. He'll meet with you there. Um, we don't know how that works. We don't claim to know, but we just believe what we confessed a few minutes ago, that we believe in the communion of saints and that when we're gathered together and we lift elements of creation up to God,
God that he, he he's there mysteriously and in, in, in faith we receive that as the body and blood of Jesus that was shed for us and um, we just do that in faith. So on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took a cup of wine, gave thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And now let us declare together the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And friends, this is the invitation to the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is to be made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here for a very long time, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come not because it is I who invite you, it is our Lord and it's his will that those who want him should meet him here. And with that said, friends, this is the body of Christ. Do you need it? And beloved, this is the blood of Christ shed for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Do you need it? Amen and amen. Guys, we thank you again for being here. Before we let you go, we just want to let you know again that we're so thankful for all of you and the ways that you all support us. Thank you for keeping us going. Without you, none of this would be possible. Again, we never twist anybody's arm. Um, we don't expect you to give. We, we kindly just ask that if you have anything left over and that if you feel connected to this ministry and would like to give and, and support us, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can give online at www.thetableokc.com forward slash donate, um, or you can text to give. You can uh, text the word give to 405-835. 6007 and donate that way. Again, we love you and we thank you. We're so appreciative for you. We have all of you in our prayers constantly. We hope that you're staying safe, that you're staying sane <laughs> um, because it's a, a crazy time to be alive. And with that in mind, I want to leave you with this benediction. God's love surrounds you. God's spirit guides you. God's whisper cheer you, God's peace calm you, God's shield protect you, God's wisdom arm you, wherever God may lead you. And the peace of God be in your hearts, and the grace of God be in your words, the love of God be in your hands, the joy of God be in your soul, and in the song that your life sings this week. We love you and we thank you. Bye, guys.